So Francis, when and where did your interest in art and craft begin? Well, I come from a, a creative family. My father was a primary school teacher, but he was very focused on art education and uh, encouraging students at the primary school to have a very well-rounded education. So at home we would have access to plasticine and lots of different materials. Also, he would have focused a lot on three-dimensional work, on puppetry and um, model making and paper mache and dinosaurs and all sorts of, of wonderful projects. So, and he was also very focused on a sort of a methodology and put a lot of stress in uh, observational and observational drawing and learning from seeing and developing ideas through the use of drawing. So that that has been a wonderful grounding for my work, and then. Um, through secondary school I went to um, St. Louis Convent and there was some very um, you know, interesting um, projects and, and the teachers there were encouraged, encouraged and further developed the work that I did. Mm. And why ceramics? Um, I think linking into my interest in three-dimensional work and then I got an opportunity to work using clay in college. I just loved the tactile quality of clay the colour of it and the endless possibilities for building a whole variety of different forms. I think it's its potential to um, allow a maker to, to create such a vast array of, of different sort of forms, I think is what I enjoy about, about using clay. Um, in college I went in with the intention of training to be a teacher. So my education in college was, was um, multifaceted. So we had a lot of theory instruction and then a lot of practical instruction in the various different um, art processes that we would need to teach at second level. So it's very focused on, on that area. So, so during that, I got an opportunity to, to, to learn about ceramic work. But it was done in, in, in quite a basic uh, vessel focused way. And the sculptural aspect to my work really only developed after I um, got involved in pursuing my own work, after I finished teaching and started to explore my own work. And um, that was in response to that challenge of what, what was I going to focus on and what was I going to, uh, going to do. So the two things that I most enjoyed in college were life sketching and ceramics. So um, one led to the other. The life sketching led to working sculpturally with the ceramic medium. The urge to do my own work was always there. So each September I'd go back for another year's teaching and say this year I'm going to get more of my own work done and it wouldn't often happen. I really enjoyed my year's teaching and I had very talented students that I thoroughly enjoyed engaging with. So I'd become completely absorbed in the work that they were developing and um, would reach to do some of my own work maybe during the summers but then um, it just it was this urge that, that grew that, that, that I, need, I knew I needed to do my own work and some family circumstances came to bear as well and that, that um, I needed to take a step back from my teaching. And so the two merged then, I had this available time and got an opportunity to, to develop my own work. I began by just um, almost setting myself a self-imposed apprenticeship nearly in that I felt that I needed to develop my ceramic skills. But um, I chose just to, um, I, I enjoyed revisiting and wanted to sort of just do my own thing beyond the, the teaching environment or the college environment. So I um, set myself as, at this task of challenging um, myself and learning how to build quite complicated forms. So working from the life sketching, I did a series of very realistic figurative pieces that were quite large scale, they were about three quarter life sized and uh, I did, so that was a self-imposed period of learning which I've been able to sort of add to over the years and it, it just brought me into my own practice and then that led very naturally then into more abstract work. I, I left, there was a stage where I left the figurative work behind and then explored more abstract work. Well, a prime uh, source of inspiration comes from the marine environment and uh, an interest in geography, an interest in biology, botany, astronomy and influences from other artists. But in, with all of those influences, I'm, I'm no scientist, but um, I enjoy um, 
getting information, visual information from all of those diverse areas and that informs, informs my practice. Certainly, um, I, my vast book collection would begin with, you know, like underwater world books and, you know, books about seeds and books about pollen. And then that leads to books like um, one I have called um, Sacred Geometry I have that and, <laughs> and um, um, books like that that go into the theory and the philosophy and the mathematics sometimes uh, that, and the, the geometry that underpins the natural world and the sort of growth purposes and the patterns and the correlations between those diverse areas. So it's the point of contact, you know, the fact that a coral reef will start to spawn in connected to the cycles of the moon is just mind-blowing or the fact that a seed will drop into the ocean um, in South America and be washed all the way across and land in the shores of County Clare and be picked up by a botanist in Ireland, you know, and the fact that those same seeds blew, uh, you know, really interested Darwin is just, that's, it's those sort of connections that really, um, that, that, that I ponder on and that excites me when I'm researching. And, but it's a visual-led research. It's, it's an engagement with, with pictures and with visuals and, and with um, things that you come across in the environment, you know. And it's an enjoyment of seeing where, the, where, where you as an individual artist can make your own connections between these, these, these visual nuggets of information. A solo show is a huge challenge. And when I initially received the invitation from the Basement Gallery in Dundalk to have a, a solo show, I realised this is going to be a huge leap forward, so I actually went to Megan Johnson in Millennium Court for some mentoring and then received a second invitation to have a solo show there. And so Megan would have helped me get my head around some of the things that I would need to do to, to uh, pace the work towards, towards a solo show. But mostly I relied on the experience of previous group shows that I would have got involved in, but it was it, uh, so Previously, I would have, at the most, have had to get maybe um, five or six pieces of work that relate together. And then, so for the solo show, it was a, it was a huge leap forward. So I had to do some research. I had to um, link up with, with threads of ideas that I had previously worked on that I saw potential for future pieces and began there and then went on this journey <laughs> of exploration. and. Um, one of the things that I had done separately was um, worked on individual pieces for exhibitions that were displayed on plinths. And then for other exhibitions, I had done some more installation focused pieces, pieces that I would have exhibited with sculpture and contacts at the Botanic Gardens. So for my solo show, I took the chance to try and combine that focus in the one body of work so that there's both um, plinth exhibited pieces and installation pieces, so 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 that was that was um, a chat both a challenge and um, an interesting sort of um, sort of counterpoint. Uh, it, it involved a little bit of counterpoint, and I, I enjoyed the, the sort of working between the, between the two approaches, if you like. I came across the name microcosmos ages and ages ago, and a friend gave me a, a video entitled Microcosmos, which, which took you on a wonderful journey into, with, with the use of fantastic photographic techniques um, into a bug's eye view of, of a meadow. And so you got to see all these insects close up and, and all of this. So the name Microcosmos, you know, stayed with me and it related to the sort of emerging ideas that I was gathering for this body of work for the solo show. So the title came quite early on and actually helped to sort of um, anchor some of the ideas that were emerging for, for, for pieces. And then, uh, you know, you just do a lot of, lot of planning and, and what happens, I think, naturally too when you're working is that one piece can often lead to another piece or sometimes one piece can contrast with a previous piece and the fact that I work in red clay and white clay would um, sort of extend the range of, of, of what I do as well. I'm all the time collecting bits and pieces from here, there and everywhere. So I have a vast and ever-growing collection of beach road stones and lots of other detritus that gets washed up on the shores near where I live. And 
so quite um, a natural just collector sort of focus and then as well as, as drawing then uh, then it brings that on once once I've done a bit of collecting and a bit of reading that does lead naturally then to doing some investigative drawing or some drawing that explores and teases out ideas and then that leads then naturally to coming close to when, when you've got an emerging idea and you've got something that you can get your teeth into drawing wise that leads naturally then to working in three dimensions where almost like I have the I make these small maquette versions of new pieces prior to making the larger piece and that is where it's almost like a 3d sketch to sketch in that you can really see around the corners of the form and a sense you get a, a sense of the proportion of the complete piece and it allows then for you to do some more technical thinking through of how you're going to approach making the final form and with the whole medium of ceramics you have got to calculate in a shrinkage during the firing process so it can be very frustrating if you're making something and you haven't you know it comes out smaller than you had intended so I do some technical drawing to to make sure that I build larger than than I than I've envisioned so that I can accommodate that shrinkage in, into the piece the final piece I hand build using a variety of different clays some of them uh, are, are heavily grogged, so they're kind of gritty, and you can achieve a certain textural finish using those. And then others are very smooth, and you can achieve, so you can achieve a variety of different textural finishes. And um, most of my work is hand-built using a coiling technique, or a derivation of that called um, an extended pinch technique. So with coiling, you're rolling out sausages of clay, and then um, at joining them together to build the wall of the piece and with the um, extended pinch it's little little uh, discs of clay that are joined together and depending on the nature of the form of the piece I'll use one or other of those techniques and it's nice to have a bit of variety in, in the way in which you build pieces as well. And then um, I, I have a, a range of different um, surface finishes that I, I use to complete the work. It's very important for me that the detail of the surface works with the form of the piece and that the two um, relate. And um, so I have used additions of clay onto the surface. I have carved the surfaces of some pieces and I've also um, pierced the walls of some of the pieces. So I've used this pinholing technique which um, I enjoy using and on, a th on the theoretical side it's, it's one of those techniques that I think unites with, with the, the nature of ceramics, the fact that a ceramic form is hollow and with this piercing technique you're sort of um, engaging with that hollowness of the ceramic form and you're sort of making the inner and outer space uh, unite in some way. So it's, it's that sort of thing that I enjoy working with. Part of what I like to do, I think it's influenced by the sort of um, inspiration for, for some of the work. My vast stone collection is, is uh, gleaned from the beaches. So these stones have been on the beaches for God knows how long, tens or hundreds of years, been trundled around with the, by the sea. So they have all the no n notches and bumps knocked off them and they're smoothed back. And also, um, I'm very influenced by by geography and and the landscape around where I, where I live, which is has you know it's a glacial landscape and it's been s sculpted to some extent by the ice. So there is this engagement with this sort of attrition, this scraping back, and that informs the work processes that I use and that I enjoy creating and building a form in clay and then um, carving it back a bit both by physically working across the surface with tools but also then by finishing the surface with abrasive sanding techniques to get to achieve that that level of finish and because I'm interested in working with the clay in its naked form and not applying glazes on I think it's very important that the surface finish is um, very well considered so that um, the piece looks complete and that the surface unites again with, with the form of the piece. I like working with the natural colour of the clay itself and the qualities of the clay itself, whether it has that grog added or whether it's a smooth, smooth clay. And um, 
there's such a variety of different color. I mean, there's a whole range of different whites of our cre cream to white. So there is a, a sort of a variety of color in the actual clay body itself. And, um, and while I enjoy, um, and have a, you know, I enjoy glazed work and looking at other people's glazed work, um, mm. and I have glazed pieces myself, but it just doesn't engage me. I, I, um, I, I just look at the building with clay and the whole um, way in which you can, you can build a whole variety of different structures is what holds my interest. And I've yet to exhaust the variety of surface finish that I can achieve with just working with that clay body and not applying. Occasionally with some of the um, grogged clays, I will apply a light coat of oxide to kind of accentuate the, the um, texture and to sort of tint the, the, the surface of the piece a little bit, but um, it's very much like a, a watery wash that's absorbed into the surface of the clay rather than applying a glassy layer of glaze over the surface. I think very carefully about how the work is presented to the audience. Um, for the solo show, um, be very early on in the making process, I designed the plinths that I wanted to use for the pieces and the pieces were made and the plinths were made to suit the scale of, of, of some of the pieces. So inspired by Brancusi and how he, he you know, thought very carefully about how work is presented on plinths, I would have uh, um, put a lot of thought and energy into that. Um, I think as an artist it's very important that you sing with your own visual voice and sometimes you need to protect that from um, any sort of instruction from the audience. I think people want to actually come to shows where they see you doing work that, that comes from your own sources of inspiration. And I have a huge respect for the audience and for what they will bring themselves to uh, in responding to the work. So uh, it's great when, when, when work resonates with, with somebody who comes to, to, to view it. But if it doesn't, that's okay too. And it's sometimes nice to get feedback where, you know, somebody might see something completely different than, than the sort of thought processes that were going through your head while you were making something in particular. And then sometimes um, ideas that you think are very embedded in your work that people mightn't spot, somebody, you know, can relate to immediately, you know, and they, they, they can read that from, from the work. So it's basically um, the pieces that I make are, are like a form of visual communication, that you're trying to encapsulate ideas that you're interested in and you invest those into the work and then you hope that in some way those ideas will resonate with people that see the pieces then. Well I have some deadlines that are coming up. Every artist needs a deadline to work towards so that's good and I find that when you're working on ev every piece of work that you make leads you to another piece. So as you're making one piece Often I'm thinking of how I could develop that into a new piece of work. So sometimes as I'm, I'm going through quite sometimes a long process of making, your, your mind is engaged with how this theme might be reworked or developed into future pieces. So as I'm working on, on current work, it it's spawns new, new ideas. So I already have some new ideas that are going to follow on from, from the body of work. And I, was li I listen to the radio while I'm working in the studio and um, there's some very interesting arts programs and there was a, a program uh, where a, an author was, was interviewed and he had just, I think he just had his third book published and he was reviewing the previous books that he had published and he was talking about the first book which in some way can relate to your first solo show and what he was saying was that he was. He, uh, other writer friends of his were saying were saying that um, your first novel contains the seeds of all your subsequent novels, and perhaps maybe a first solo show by an artist contains the seeds for the future solo shows. The thing that I enjoy most about my work is exploring and developing ideas, and um, and the engagement with the the clay material. I love working with clay, and 
I like the process of hand building with clay because you, the pieces grow almost organically and often I would work across two or three pieces at the same time. So there's this rhythm of working that is sustained through the building process and the finishing process and I really enjoy all of that.